Our theme for the weekend is called The Change. We've got five sessions together, um, if you can go the whole way. Tonight, uh, three sessions tomorrow, two in the afternoon, one in the evening, and then we'll finish this theme, Called to Change, on Sunday night. And then we've got sort of uh, normal church services Sunday morning sort of thing, if they can use the word normal, if that's okay, all right? Uh, we, we, we'll be doing church as usual here on Sunday morning. I think, Sam, you're preaching Sunday morning, so that'll be a great weekend of just sharing uh, together. And we're looking at this idea of being called to change. And tonight, I, 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 want, to th- I want us to think about uh, this idea within that, that, that within the call to change, there needs to be a catalyst for change. And over the weekend, we're going to look at a journey of how not just we as individuals can change, but actually we as a community can change together. And that's one of the greatest challenges on us. I've seen some magnificent uh, churches decline because they refuse to change, because they refuse to negotiate different seasons in their lives. I've seen wonderfully gifted, talented people uh, struggle because they're struggling with the idea of moving from one thing to another. And change is nothing to be afraid of. Yes, it's often a bit messy. It can be difficult. It can be uncomfortable. Um, my, my wife said to me when we moved into our, 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 our current home, she said, I never want to see another box again for a very, very long time. Because when you're packing your life up and you're putting it in a box and shoving it into a lorry and then unpacking that in a new place with new neighbors and new challenges, all of that's deeply uncomfortable. And you, you just wish you could do all of that without the discomfort and without the hassle and without the aggro. But, but actually, if we can understand that that discomfort and that sometimes that messiness and that challenge um, is not there to hurt us, but it's part of the process of change, then actually we embrace it. And we say, this is just part of the journey. This is part of of what we need to do. And lots of people back off change because it's uncomfortable. And yet it's absolutely fundamental to our journey. And whoever you are, so let me speak to every individual here before we launch into this. Whoever you are as an individual, uh, change is, is part of your journey. It has to be. We, we cannot remain the same. If we're following after the things of God, we cannot remain the same. If you're a part of this church or part of another Christian community, change is part of the journey. And the, the harder we work to keep things the same will simply ensure that we are shortening our effectiveness in terms of our future and going forward. So, so it, it doesn't have to be something that's negative and hurtful, but it is something we have to consider as being Uh, part of the journey that we are on. So, if you've got a Bible with you, I'm going to read from a a lovely passage that sort of suggests this idea of change. Could have read from a a lot of different passages in the Bible, but I want to read from this one just to pick it up, and we'll we'll take it uh, from there. So, it's Isaiah 54. Now, let me set the context for you. Though the language here, it seems to be that God is speaking to a woman. In this passage, he's not actually speaking to a literal woman. So in this passage, prophetically, he's actually speaking to the nation of Israel. He's speaking to a nation that is coming back from exile, and God is trying to get them to look forward to a new day of opportunity and a new day of possibility, and it will mean for them change. Now, even though he's speaking to that nation, and we mustn't forget that in our conversation over the weekend, I think there are principles within here, the things that he says to the nation in the form of this woman that we can apply to ourselves as individuals, and we could even apply to our journey as a Christian community. And that's what we're going to attempt to do. So please, I I understand Isaiah 54 has a big picture interpretation. So don't come at me and sort of say, John, you've got the interpretation of Isaiah 54 wrong. I I know what that's about, but we're going to lift the principles within it and apply them 
to our journey as we go forward without ignoring the big picture. Is that okay? Is that all right then? So some of you uh, may be aware of that, and uh, that's important just to say before we get going. So here we go, Isaiah 54, and it says this, Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid, you will not suffer shame. Do not fear uh, disgrace, you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name, the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called God of the whole earth. So at the heart of this passage is this idea. In order to become what I want you to become, you're going to have to change. That's really, really there. So however, whichever way you're going to interpret this passage, big picture, about the nation, or we're going to lift it, the principles and the ideas, we're going to need you to make some changes. And if you can have the courage to make the changes I'm asking you to make, and, and the implication in the text is God's going to help her with those changes. If you're prepared to make those changes, God says, there is an amazing opportunity waiting for you beyond this moment. But you've got to be prepared to engage in the change right now. He, the Lord is almost saying to her, you can't wait until it happens to change. You've got to change before it happens. And, and that's a really difficult idea for every one of us. That It's one thing to have change forced on you. And we've all been in those moments where literally change has been forced on us, right? Maybe we've lost a job, that's a change forced on you. Maybe you felt unwell, that's a change that's forced on you. Maybe someone bumped your car, that's a change forced on you. Things that happen that you didn't expect and you've had to react to those things and therefore change appropriately. And that's one sense of change. And most of us are sort of used to that because that's how life works a lot of the time. The harder area of change is to change ahead of the moment, is to proactively change, is to make a change before the thing you're changing for happens. That's much more difficult. So let's think about, for example, uh, saving money, all right? Uh, and in fact, you're saving money for something that hopefully will happen or can happen or might happen, okay? But, but when you're saving that money, nothing's happening. It's just going into a bank account. It's going into your piggy bank. It's, it's just going into that. And there's a sense in which you're motivating that money into your piggy bank because you're thinking about what is going to happen, not what is happening. And that's why lots of people, uh, and, and I meet them a lot, lots of people, young people and older people, struggle with the idea of just saving a little bit of money because they, they can't quite see what's coming and therefore can't see the importance of doing that right now. Uh, we, we love the idea of what it might become, but making the changes now to make that become is much more difficult. So, so that's what's happening here. It's not that the, the change is being forced on the woman and suddenly she has to change her tent. Uh, actually, life's good for this woman at the moment, and God is saying, I've got an amazing future for you, but in order to engage with that future, you're going to have to make some changes now which will look a bit strange. But if you can trust me that the changes you're making today are going to help prepare for tomorrow, then amazing things can happen. You with me? So, so as followers of Jesus, we're being encouraged not just to be good at changing reactively, 
but we need to think about changes that are proactive. Things we do before it happens, not just when it happens. With me? Does that make sense to you? And that's an important idea for us, and it's at the heart of this passage, and we'll keep coming back to that, that idea as we go. Now let me, by way of introduction, say this. Look, when it comes to change, change is totally natural. It's a natural thing. I am genuinely amazed at the reaction of, of sometimes spiritual communities, Christian communities, to change. When change is an absolute natural part of your life. Now it's been a year since we've seen each other, and we have all changed. Some with interesting haircuts. <laughs> Some of us have put on a wee bit of weight. Some of us have lost a little bit of weight. Some of us got married. Some of us became grandparents. We have all changed. Now, on the surface of it, it might look like we're sort of the same. But you are not the same person in the same place you were last year. Now, I know some of you will think, no, no, I am. No, you're not. You haven't remained in the same place. You have already negotiated some change. And change is absolutely natural in our life. And when we understand how natural it is, it becomes easier to negotiate. Look, this is, this is me as a baby. That's me there. Now, I discovered something today that Dave and June, uh, Pastor Dave and June, started going together in the year I was born. That's a bit scary for them, isn't it? So they're celebrating their golden wedding anniversary uh, in April. You're, you're, yeah, come on. It's like, you are a hard crowd to impress. 50 years married plus a bit of change at the beginning as well in terms of uh, being together. So they've been together in terms of a relationship as long as I've been alive. I'm 53 at the moment, 54 in my next birthday. 1966, a good year, David, a good year. England won the World Cup. I got born, and Dave and June met. What a wonderful year that was. Anyone else in 1966, important year for you? No, no, 66, man. All right, st stick with the year. Stop, stop messing. Okay, 1966, there we are. And that's me. In 1966, what a beautiful baby I was. What happened? What happened to me? I don't know. Uh, I grew up. But of course, I, I didn't stay a baby. That's me there. I know that that's a bit of a grainy image, but that is me there in the middle. Uh, we're all changing. And then it doesn't stay that, that way either. Uh, this is me. That, and the tall one in the background, the one that everybody now thinks has been adopted. Uh, that's me uh, just there. And then, of course, life doesn't stay there. Now I have my own family. So this is my family with, with my son and my daughters and my son-in-law uh, and my wife. And we've got our own family. And then life doesn't stay the same again. It changes yet again. It's natural. Now, now the man kissing the baby who looks like him when he was a baby uh, has naturally changed. He can't stay a baby. Now, now, he was a gorgeous baby, but you can't stay a baby. Okay. We have, to, we have to change. Uh, and, and actually, that change from baby to adulthood, nothing wrong with that. It's totally natural. And it's very important. So, so we can celebrate every stage of the change. Just because I'm celebrating one stage of the change doesn't mean I am undervaluing another stage. So I, I love being... Uh, an adult. I love being in my 50s. People say, you know, uh, when I turn 50, how do you feel? Is that a trick question? I have no idea how to answer that question. What do you mean, how do I feel? I felt just like I felt when I was 49, but just older. All right, so I'm 50. I love, so I love being in my 30s. I love being in my 40s. Love being in my 50s, okay? I love uh, every stage of my life, but just because I love being in my 50s doesn't mean I, I'm disrespecting my 40s. Just because I love being 45 doesn't mean I was disrespecting being 25. It's just different stages of the process. And we must be careful that in moving into a new stage of change, 
that just because we embrace the new moment of change doesn't mean we're disrespecting the previous moment. Just natural. It's natural to move from a baby to an adult. Uh, and that is a normal and natural moment. The second thing to, to recognize is that change is normal. In fact, not changing is the abnormal. Are you with me? So change is totally normal in the context of our, of our lives. And uh, I, so some of you will know I, I love writing and I'm engaged in writing. And one of the things I'm deeply grateful for is that we've moved from big, heavy, key typewriters to feather touch uh, computers and, and laptops. So I have a laptop and you hardly have to touch the buttons the keys, to make it work. So, so I, I, I did a PhD. Some of you know I did a PhD a few years ago. My PhD in word count was 132,000 words. Okay? So to give you an idea, in the footnotes of my PhD, so when you write a PhD and you make a statement, you've got a reference where you got the statement from. That goes into a footnote at the end of the page. In my footnotes, I wrote 22,000 words. So I had 22,000 words in the bit at the bottom of the page that wasn't even the bit that you read on the page. Okay, so, so that's the sort of, so the, the, the PhD was 310 pages long, A4 size. Okay, now John, what's the point? The point is, I could not imagine writing that on a typewriter. Okay, because the amount of changes I had to make the mistakes I made, the editing I had to do. I mean, when I, when I got to the end of my PhD, what happens is you sit in front of a board and then you have to defend your PhD. So you've done four years of work, then you have to sit in front of a group of experts and you have to sort of defend your ideas. If they think your defense of your ideas are good, you pass. If they think the defense of your ideas and your PhD is rubbish, Four years' work gets flushed down the toilet. You feel. That's it. It's done. And so I had to defend it. And I passed, and the man said to me, you've just got to make some changes to some spellings and rearrange some, and you need to insert this document. Now, if I had have had to do that work on a typewriter, it would have taken me two months because I would have literally had to retype the whole PhD. But because it was on a computer... I was just able to slot a page in, repaginate, and everything just slotted back in. I managed to do all those changes in one day. All right? Now, at that moment, I was glad that we changed. Now, I love typewriters. In fact, for, for my office at home, I'm looking for a cool typewriter like this, just for nostalgia. Not because I want to use it, but because they're cool looking. Okay, and I want, a, I want a typewriter, a proper old typewriter, uh, sort of sitting there in my office as a sort of a nostalgia thing. I'll never use it. I never want to use it because I want to have my fingers working when I'm 60. Uh, but I love my laptop. But, I, but that, that typewriter sitting there is a reminder, not only is change natural, but change is normal. It's normal to see something move from one style to another style. Now listen, there was nothing wrong with the typewriter. My wife learned to type on it. My wife could type 180 words a minute on that. That one. My fingers would fall off if I was typing that fast. Okay? My sister uh, it was, a, was a copy typist and she did her training on this and she's actually got, uh, some of her fingers have gone misshaped because she banged the keys so hard, right? Amazing. Now listen, there was nothing wrong with that. In fact, that in its day was amazing. But this. Yeah, come on. Dave's got one. He's got a, a little mini one sitting on his knee. You, you don't even know he's typing. It's so quiet. It's so amazing. Now, now listen, that is good and that is good. But that is a sign of change. That's all that's happened. We've taken a brilliant idea and just made it better or just moved it 
into a better context. Uh, and just because I love my laptop doesn't mean a typewriter's rubbish. They're just change. Are you with me? Come on, are you there? Change, lastly, is necessary. So it's not only natural, we're all changing. Whether we want to change or not, we are changing. Change is normal uh, and should be embraced as just part of our journey. But I would also argue, finally, by way of introduction, that change is necessary. We need to change. And this is the point that God's trying to get across to this woman. You must change. You cannot expect a different result by continuing to do the same things. So if you want something different tomorrow, we're going to have to do something different today. Are you with me? So, so that's an important idea for us. So, so, so here we are. Here's, here's, a, here's a gorgeous sort of old antique telephone. Beautiful things. And you can pick these up in, a, in, a, in sort of antique shops or wherever. And, and all that retro stuff's coming back in. I don't know if you've noticed, but retro is cool. My, my oldest daughter uh, and her husband bought a record player. Right? They got a... Now, when I say record player, I mean, you know one of those, like, square ones that you put a vinyl record on. Remember those? Uh, some of you still have one, maybe. And you, and you drop the needle onto it and play it. And, and I remember... Now, my, my daughter is currently 26. She bought this when she was, I think, 23. And her husband bought a record player with, like, proper vinyl records. My first words to her were, why? Why did you do that? We've left all that behind. We've got, we've got like Spotify now. Why, why, do you want, why do you want vinyl when you can have Spotify? It's amazing. So, so I, I've, got, I've got hundreds of songs on my Spotify list, on my phone, and on my iPod, which I listen to when I'm studying. And, and there's no clutter. There's no records. There's no, you know, polishing the vinyl. Keep your fingers off the vinyl. Don't scratch the vinyl. You know, be careful how you put the needle on the vinyl. My goodness. But, but I don't know if you've noticed, we're going retro. Everybody's, it's like, it's like we're going back to the old cool stuff because it looks great and it feels great. But it's not always great. The problem with that is we had a phone, and, and I remember getting our t- first telephone in our house in Belfast. It was fixed to the wall in the hall. And we shared a line with our next door neighbor. That was awkward. So you would pick up the phone and sometimes hear our neighbor on the phone. I know you think, what? No, this is true. Okay, and we had to sort of negotiate when we got on the phone uh, to do that. And you could only stand in the hallway. And we didn't have a phone in the bedroom. We didn't have a phone in the living room. You know, you had to literally stand in the hall and talk to people on the phone. That was cool when I was eight. (laughs) But but today, we've got stuff like this. It isn't just a phone, it's a video recorder. People have been taking photographs tonight uh, and maybe putting that on social media. And, And these things now take incredible pictures. I have pictures hanging in my home that you would put money were taken, uh, money on it, were taken by a, a photographer, a proper photographer, and they were taken on a phone, put on a canvas, and hung on a wall. They go, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, iPhone, with me. <laughs> it's incredible. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's the, the change. Now, that's not chained to a wall. That can go with me anywhere. Now, sometimes that's not a good thing. When you're dropping your phone down the toilet, that's, that's, that's maybe the moment when you realize having a phone attached to the wall was a good thing. But actually being able to take your phone in your back pocket anywhere is an amazing change. Some people don't like that change. Some people love that change. Some people couldn't imagine now life with, without this. And other people wish... Life was without that, but we've changed. And actually, there was nothing wrong with the phone in the wall in my hallway. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, 
as an eight-year-old, it was cool. I used to love dialing the phone. Who had one of those circular dial phones? Who had one? And you just do it, spin it around, and go, come back. Remember that? Wasn't it cool? Okay. Took forever, but it was cool. Okay. And you would, and, and I remember telephone numbers. I used to have all the telephone numbers in my head because you had to memorize them. And now they're all on my phone, and I don't, I don't even know my wife's mobile number. If you offered me a thousand pound, tell me your wife's mobile number. Couldn't tell you. All right? Because it's in my phone, not in my head when it should be. So, so it's change. Change is natural. Change is normal. Change is necessary. Now, listen, each case, what you've changed from is not necessarily bad. So we're not saying that even in this case we're having to change something because it's bad. We're we're taking something that's good and making the changes to make it even better. That's really where God lives. That's where God's at. He's, He's not just about changing things that are broken and making them better. He's also about changing things that are good and making them better. So the Lord took us in our brokenness and changed us. We say amen to that. That's amazing. But But actually, when I became a Christian, that was just the beginning of my change. I've been changing ever since. In fact, I would argue with you, I probably changed more in the last 15 years of my life than I changed in all the previous years put together. My my mentality has changed. Some of my behaviors have changed. Uh, The way I think about money has changed. Uh, The way I I do family. Some of my relationships and the way I do them have changed. The way I approach life as a man, as a father, uh, as as a husband, as a leader. Many of those things are changing. So, so when I became a Christian, so an amazing change took place. God took me from sinner and made me a saint. He, he took me from a lost person, made me a found person. He took me from an enemy and he made me a family member. He took me from, from a, a lost in sin, a sinner, and he brought me into his family. What an amazing change. He delivered me from that brokenness. But that wasn't the end. That's the beginning of the change. Now now he says, okay, now that I have introduced you to change, let's keep changing. Let's move from glory to glory, from stage to stage, from, from, okay, uh, I'm saved now, that's it. No, 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 that's the beginning of it. Uh, And actually, as men and women, if if you've had your life changed by Jesus, as men and women who've had our lives changed and impacted by the grace of God, then actually we should be more open to change than any other group of people in this town because we've seen the power of it. Haven't we? Some of us wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for Jesus stepping into our world and changing us. And so he hasn't just changed us, but he wants us to embrace change. Wants us to understand that change is natural, Change is normal and change is necessary. And I believe that if we're taking the Bible seriously, change is an essential part of the journey. And that actually as we follow after him, we are going to change. We're going to be called to change. We're going to be asked to change. We may even be, can I say this carefully, forced to change. But where God is going will mean to go with him, we have to change. Does that make sense to you? And that's at the heart of this journey. Let me, let me show you the heart of, heart of the change here in this verse. It says, look at, look at the words very carefully. When speaking to the woman, he says this, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who had a husband. Now, it's dead easy to miss this, but look at the tensing of this passage. More are. Now, note that. Not more will be. More are. So, God is speaking in the present tense about something that will happen in the future. All right? 
So what does that teach us? It t- it t- well, one of the things it teaches us is this. God's already in the place where we are going. And because he's already where we're going, he speaks about it as though it is. So John, what? <laughs> okay. God is already where we're going. So let's think about our woman here. He's already in the future where she has all these children. Okay? So because he's already in her future, he's able to step into her present and talk about her future as if it's already happened. So when God speaks a word like this to us, he he is not just telling us of what's going to happen, but he's trying to position our mentality to accept what will happen as if it has happened and therefore to change our behavior appropriately. Now, if we get this wrong, it'll look crazy. It'll look like bonkers, and that's why this is risky. Because if, if we get this wrong, it looks like we've just gone off on one. But if we get this right, what's happening is this, is that God, because he's all present, he's, he's in the past, he's in the present, and he's in the future. Don't ask me to explain that. That's just the way he is. He's everywhere at once, not just omnipresent in terms of all over the world. He is multidimensional. He's in past, present, and future. He lives in it all, right? That makes my head hurt. But what it means is this, that because he was and is and shall be, because he's alpha and omega, beginning and first and last, he's there and he's looking at what we can become and we will become And then he speaks to our present in in the hope that we will grab what we will become. So believe him that we're going to have more children. So that's the first bit. But secondly, because we believe that bit, we start behaving now differently. So we start behaving towards what we are becoming not what we are. Does that make sense to you? I, I know, please forgive me if a Friday night, John, making my head hurt. I just want to be blessed. But, but this is so important for us. If, if, if I continue to behave today the way I'm behaving, tomorrow I will produce the results I'm producing today. So in order for God to get us where he needs us to go, He has to show us an alternative tomorrow. He's calling us. He's given us a sense of purpose towards tomorrow. And and, and that does two things. Number one, it's saying to me, he's already in my future, which is amazing. But it's also saying, he's calling me to that future. And therefore, I'm having to make changes today in my future that won't necessarily produce something today, but will position me for tomorrow. You with me? So let me, let, let me give you an example of this. This is a tricky example, but I can share this because it happened a long time ago. So I can share something like this. And I remember uh, Dawn and I uh, were really feeling God stir us about the level of our financial giving. Now, now, now we, we were pretty committed, and, and John's made a long journey with us, so we were pretty committed, seriously committed, to, to trying to honor God with our finance. But we really felt God say to us, uh, I, I want you to step up into something more. And so this wasn't just me, you know, trying to press God's buttons and get more money back. It wasn't just, it was me feeling something deep inside me, a bit like this, woman would have felt, I felt like God was really speaking to me about this. And so Don and I then waited on the Lord and and just, what does that, what does that look like uh, for us? And here's what I felt the Lord say to me. Now, this is not in the Bible, okay? And I'm not saying anyone in this room should do this, but this is how it happened for us in this, as an example. I felt the Lord say this to me, tithe 
to me not on what you earn, but what you would like to earn. Okay? Now, what was amazing was I had a figure in my brain. So this is where it's all, it's all very, it's where I have to be careful about using an example like this because I don't want this to become a sort of a pattern for anybody. I'm giving you an example of God speaking to me about the future when it was way off in the present. Now, I had a figure in my head and as the Holy Spirit came to me and said, tithe on what you think you should be earning or please forgive the language, on what you think you're worth. I had a figure popped in my head. And I said to Dawn, that's what I think I'm worth. And so the Holy Spirit said, tithe on that. Right? Now, what I thought I was worth and what I was actually worth, <laughs> there was a fairly substantial gap. All right? I'm, I'm trying to be careful. I don't want to offend anybody. It was a really big gap. So here's what I had now a choice. Here's the choice I had. God spoke to me about the future. And he spoke into my present. And here's what he was saying. Change your present behavior in accordance with your future. So suddenly I had a choice. Here was my choice. My choice was, okay, I think I've had too much pizza and it's affecting my brain, and I heard something weird from God, which I'm not going to accept, so I'm just going to continue to give at my normal rate, right? Or I go, this sounds like God. It sounds, it's crazy. How, we, how do we explain this to people? And in fact, we never talked about it till years later, okay? But we made a faith decision. We wouldn't behave in accordance to where we were. We would, by faith, behave in accordance to where we wanted to go. Now, I would love to tell you, that after the first month, angels, <laughs> angels just drop money into our account and, you know, secret. For the first three or four months, it was unbelievably hard. It just threw our budgets out. We were giving a significant amount of money away on top of everything else. Uh, washing machines broke down. You know, televisions went on the blink. All that happened uh, without exaggeration. And it was probably four to six months of excruciating challenge. And then something happened. And a breakthrough took place. Now, now I, I, I don't want to go into details because I don't want people to then compare my story to your story. That's not the point. But the point is this. We broke into a future that actually God was helping us to imagine before it happened. All right? And the key for us at that moment was behaving towards the future, not just the present. Does that make sense to you? You sure? I know that may seem very disturbing and a little bit edgy, but let me bring you back to Isaiah 54. This is exactly what God is saying to her. He's telling her, I see your future. Your future is filled with children. Therefore, you have to change your behavior today for that future. You can't just wait for that future to happen. Trust me with that future. Believe in that future and make the changes towards that future. And as a result, the woman, I'll talk, to her, I'll talk about her as a woman in this case, the woman had to make three significant changes or be prepared to make them, okay? And I hope these help you as I sort of set up the weekend. We're, we'll be finished in a few moments. She had to make a change in mentality. Okay? What change in mentality did she, did she have to make? Now, now, please don't be offended by this, but let me, let me just put this there. She had to move from barren to mother. Now, at this stage, she's not a mother. 
But God is asking her to think like a mother before she becomes one. Wow. Okay? More are the children of the desolate woman. More are. See, it's that, it's that little phrasing, more are, not more will be. Oh, 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 when you hold your children, it'll be easy to imagine yourself a mother. But God is saying, stop thinking of yourself as barren, because when you think of yourself as barren, you behave barren. But start thinking of yourself as a mother. When you think of yourself as a mother, you will start to do the things today that mothers would be expected to do. Come on, are you with me? I know this is a challenge for us. But lots of beautiful Christians are waiting for God to bring everything to them and do everything for them and drop it all into the world. And every now and again, God will do that for you. He will. He'll just drop stuff right in your lap because he's brilliant and he's amazing. But many times, God will ask us to make a move into something before it has even happened. And for that to happen, we've got to shift in our mentality. We have to see, stop seeing ourselves as what we are and start seeing ourselves as how he sees us. So he saw her as a mother. She saw herself as barren. And he addresses that. He, what does he call her? He speaks to her and says, oh, barren woman. Now, that's not what he sees. That's what she sees. That's, that's her label. That's who she sees herself as. I am a barren woman. But God speaks to the barren woman and says, no, no, you're not barren. You are a mother to all of these children. You are going to have all of these things, and I need you to start thinking as a mother, not as, as barren. And when God comes to us individually and collectively as a community, one of the things he always seeks to change is our mentality. In fact, without a shift in our mentality, there will never be a shift in our behavior. Okay? Okay? So that's why sometimes before change happens, there's a, a shaking, a disturbing, a discomfort in our world because God's trying to get something into my mind, get something into my heart, get something into my thinking. And once you see this, you'll see it all over the Bible. The angel comes to a young teenage girl and he says to her, you're highly favored. She didn't quite understand what he meant by that. And they get into the conversation, and he essentially tells her she's going to be the mother to God in flesh. She's going to be the mother of Jesus, God in, the son of God in flesh. And here's what she says. How can that be? You need to explain that to me. How's that going to work? Because I'm a virgin. I've never had sex with anybody, and I'm not sure how that's going to work. But the angel then explains to her, and here's what she says at the end of it, may it be to me as you have said. She makes a shift into something in her mentality that gives God, please forgive my language, gives God permission to make the change. Here's the amazing thing. God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe, and my mind can stop him. So if he says to me, you're a mother, and I keep telling him, no, I'm barren. Jesus lived in a place called Nazareth. 18, 20 miles down the road, he went to a place called Capernaum, and Capernaum was a sort of northern headquarters. At Capernaum, he saw amazing miracles. He went back to his home village, and here's what it says. He was amazed at their unbelief. Exactly. And then it goes on to say, here's the killer. Here's the, here's the, the killer statement. Because of that, he was unable. So 18 miles down the road, 
more miracles than you can wag a stick at. Was Capernaum sort of more atmospheric than Nazareth? No, no, no. Well, the difference is mentality. You've got a mentality in one town that goes, please come, please do your thing, we're open, please, 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 come and touch us. And so incredible things happen. He goes back to another place and they go, who do you, who do you think you are? Who are you? We know who you are. You're Mary's son. Get lost. And because of that, the miracles that Capernaum saw, Nazareth missed. Was Jesus less powerful in Nazareth? No. Same power. Was he less God? No. Same God. What was restricting God? It was the mentality. And, and if God's spoken words to you, now this is where it gets tricky. If God's spoken words to you, the challenge for each of us is we've got to grab the mentality at the heart of that word, not just the word, and start thinking as God sees us, not as we see us. And for this church, in the, in the change that you are negotiating and about to negotiate, we have to try, without being weird and wacky and off the wall and stupid, right? And there's a lot of that going around. We've got to watch that. We've got to ask ourselves a question. What is God saying to Living Waters Church about our future? And whatever we think he's saying, we've got to think that now. We've got to think not only where we are, but we've got to think into where we are going. And that's not positive thing, that's not positive psychology. That's me grabbing God, what God sees, how God sees, and what God says, and I grab that. Uh, and that's not fantasy or weirdness or positive psychology. That's me grabbing God's word. And because I grabbed it, it brings a change in the way I see myself or the way I see in this local church or the way I see where we are. And it changes the way I see myself. Therefore, that will naturally change the way I behave. If I see myself as barren, I will behave barren. If I see myself as mother, I will behave mother. You with me? What's God saying to this church? And listen, God may be calling this church to a future that looks a bit different or maybe just more of the same than what you've had. But, but listen, going forward is not dishonoring what has been. In fact, it's normal. It's natural. And even it's necessary. And I know Dave and June would say that. They, there has to be. If this church looks the same in 10 years as it is now, there's something wrong. I mean, physically, this church has changed in 10 years. This, this building didn't look like this 10 years ago when I first came. Your influence has changed. Your programs have changed. You have changed. Now, there's been challenges and difficulties, but you've changed. Now, the next 10 years, if this looks exactly the same... And if you still had the courage to be inviting me back in 10 years' time, and I turned up and this was exactly the same, though I would still love to be here, there would be something in me that's going, okay. Are you with me? Come on. Here's a second idea really quickly, and it's this. She had to change. There had to be a change of confession. So change in mentality, barren to mother, change in confession. What was the change of confession? From sorrow to joy. Sing. Sing. Oh, barren woman. Sing. Shout for joy. What? You're expecting me to sing for joy when... And in the Middle East, and this is why this is such a powerful analogy, in the Middle East for a woman uh, to not have children was, was in some cases considered shame and in other cases considered a curse. I, I don't agree with that. That's just the way 
the world was for that woman. And so here she has no children, and yet God is saying, sing. Change your confession. Now, this is where it looks weird, and, and all of this is borderline weird. Now, seriously, honestly, it is. So, if God speaks to us about our future, and we start behaving towards our future, not just living in our present, it will look weird. That's why it has to be God, because if it's not God, it is weird. Okay? So, so when God speaks, I start changing my mentality. I see myself not as barren, but as mother. And that's weird. No, no, it's only weird if God's not in it. And then I start singing. What are you singing about? Because God showed us a glimpse of the future. God's showing us where we're going. God's showing us that although there's barrenness now, there's going to be more children in our tent than of the woman who's married and honored. And so we start to sing into our future. Now, you can sing literally, and, and churches have done this. Some of the worship songs we sing, we sang a worship song tonight, Raise a Hallelujah, that was a From Sorrow to Joy song. In fact, the context of the writing of that song is profound difficulty and pain. And, and the song doesn't match the experience. You're thinking, you can do the research, check it out. You can probably ask Beth and she'll, she'll explain that to you afterwards. But you've just got to trust me on that. The song and the circumstance are poles apart. What's happening there? God is calling a confession out that isn't there yet. Now, now again, if we go over into the deep end on this, it can, it can be dangerous. But if it's God, it's, it's not dangerous it's dynamic. Because here's what's happening. I'm speaking God's word over my life as an individual. I'm speaking God's word over my community. I'm speaking God's word over my street. I'm speaking God's word over my, my town. Not as it is, but as it will be. And because God said it, it already is. Just not in my reality. In his reality, it's already there. In my reality, it's still coming. But I'm being called to sing as if God's reality was my reality. You with me? Let, let, let me, a personal, personal story again. I, we, we moved home the 28th of January. Some of you know our journey. So you know we've had a few interesting years. And, uh, and we moved home to, uh, and John, uh, John's been to our home, to, to what I would describe for Don and I, a home of our dreams. I mean, amazing. Just blown away by what God's done for us. And we moved on the 28th of January. On the 29th of January, I got up at 6 o'clock as normal to go and do my daily devotions in a house without oil. <laughs> um, it was freezing. So we hadn't, we hadn't got the, the wood burner going by then because we thought we still had, still had oil. So I, I woke up thinking, why is the house so cold? And went and sat in the living room to do my devotions, got a blanket out, pepperoni, the spiritual sausage dog. He got on my knee and he's snuggling in on me and the, together we kept warm. And as I was doing my devotions, the Holy Spirit reminded me of a promise he made to me at the beginning of 2017. So this is three years later. In 2017, in one of the darkest moments of my life, I'd just been sacked from a high-profile ministry position, and I sat in my home then, brokenhearted. And the Holy Spirit said this to me from the book of Job. He is wooing you from the jaws of distress. He will set your feet in a spacious place, free from restriction, to the comfort of a table laden with choice food. That's from Book of Job, chapter 36. And I wrote that down, marked it in my Bible. And every single day, David, every single day, I have confessed, I am in a spacious place. God will lead me to a spacious place. I am preparing for that spacious place. God will not abandon us to distress. 
every single day. Speaking that word out. Literally quoting it to God. He gave it to me so I can quote it back to him. Okay, this is what you told me to say, so here it is. Uh, and humbly, not, not arrogantly or, or audaciously, but humbly by faith coming to him and saying, you give me this word, I am speaking this word. Now, every day I spoke that word from then to the 28th of January didn't feel like a spacious place. In fact, for most of that time, I lived in a rented house with, with neighbors who weren't very nice. They didn't even like my sausage dogs. And in that rented house, in, in that restricted place, in, in the neighbors that weren't being very nice to us, in the confusion, every single day I made a confession. You are leading me to a spacious place, free from restriction. I, and, and John will tell you, I, I, I sat that morning on the 29th and it suddenly hit me. This is the spacious place. You're in the spacious place. This is where God has brought. It took three years. And if you'd have heard me confessing spacious place in the places where we were, you thought, he's lost it. He's crackers. He's bonkers. But what was happening, we were being encouraged to confess what God had promised, not what I had made up. That's the difference, right? I'm not confessing my idea, confessing his idea. I was, I was confessing God's future, confessing joy over the sorrow, and believing that God would do it. And that's what he's asking the woman to sing. Don't sing the song that reflects where you are. Sing the song that reflects where you're going. With me? That makes sense? I, I don't know if that'll, hopefully over the weekend that'll click together. Here's the last idea, and I'm done, and then we're going to sing a couple of songs together and, and worship the Lord as we close. The third thing she's being asked to do, and we'll unpack this a wee bit more tomorrow, is she was being asked to bring a change to her location. So, a change in mentality, a change of confession, a change to location. What's she being asked to do? She's being asked to go from small to big. Now, I want you to see a couple of things that are really important. There was nothing wrong with her tent. God didn't say, your tent's rubbish. Get rid of it. There was nothing wrong with her tent. The only problem with her tent was it wasn't big enough for where he wanted her to go. Therefore, she had to take the existing tent and enlarge it. But, but here's the second thing I want you to see. She had to enlarge before she was even pregnant. Now, it's one thing to build your extension when the babies come. It's another thing to build the extension when you're not even pregnant yet. What, what are you extending your tent for? Babies. Yeah, but you're barren. No, I'm a mother. Right? Now again, outside of God, it, it's weird. And, and it, it will make us look like we are on the wrong side of normal. Right? But if it's God, it's dynamic. If, if God's in it, then we're extending, whether that's literal or metaphorical, we're changing the location in preparation for what will be. And, and that can literally happen to someone physically. It can happen in a behavioral pattern. It can happen in the way we serve. It can happen in the way we give. But what we're doing, we're making a physical change that is reflecting where we believe God wants us to go. Yes? And, and that small to big mentality can be an amazing shift. When, when I was pioneering with Dawn, our first little church, we were just a couple of years into pioneering. We had a handful of people 
It was hard work. We started with 13. On the first Sunday, went down to 12. And then slowly grew. By the end of the first year, including Dawn moving from college to marry me, we grew to 20. From 12 to 20. That was pretty good. Pretty good growth. But 20 people on a Sunday just didn't feel like we were changing the world, right? And, and in the midst of that little place, first couple of years of being there, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. And here's what I felt the Holy Spirit say. One day you're going to write books. Right? And that's weird. That's weird. Because, like, I'd never written anything apart from a couple of sermons and a few essays at Bible college. I, I, it wasn't like I woke up in the morning dreaming of being a writer. Nothing like that at all. But I felt that's so strong in me, you're going to write books. And so, um, about a few months later, at our local little village hall, they put on free education classes. And one of the free education classes they put on was touch typing. Not on a typewriter, by the way. On a word processor. And, and I saw the advert. I said to Dawn, I'm going to go and learn to touch type. She said, why? I said, because I think one day I'm going to write stuff. And being able to touch type would really help me. And I turned up to that class, the only man in a class of about 15 women. It was quite intimidating. It was good, but it was intimidating, I have to be say. And you sat in front of this word processor. They had this, had this cool program. And of course, when you learn to touch type, you're not allowed to look at your fingers. That's the point. So you, you've got to put your fingers over the keys in a certain position. And then you've got to trust your fingers to find the keys. And, and you follow the words on the, on the program. And every time you got it wrong, it bleeped. If it bleeped five times, the program locked out. And then the woman had to come and unlock you. And you started again. And I was bleeping all over the place. I was like, bleep, bleep. Everything was bleeping. And after the first lesson, I'm thinking, I know humans can do this because my wife can do this. And there are women in this room who can do this. But I don't think men can do this stuff. It's like my brain can't do this. It, it just won't work. And I went home to my wife and I said, she said, how did it go? She said, it was terrible. I bleeped everywhere. I got locked out of my program a half a dozen times. People were laughing at me. I, I can never do this. And here's what she said. Just persist. Here's what she says. Just persist. There will come a moment when it just clicks. I said, when's that? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> but it will happen. You've just got to trust yourself. Keep doing it and the brain will click. And so I uh, kept going, kept going, kept going. And there was a clicking moment where somehow my brain and my fingers connected. And I started to do it without thinking about it. Amazing. Now, if I come to type and I look at the keyboard, I, I can hardly type. It's like it takes ages. But if I just look at the screen and put my fingers down, I start typing. I can type almost as fast as I can think a word, right? I can just type the word onto it. It's amazing. Now, when I first started that, that little, I thought, I can never do this. But I persisted in changing because of where this was going. Now, I, that was, let me just think about the date. So that we got married in 1988. So that would have been 1991. I wrote my first book, 2003. So I made a change in 1991 that didn't manifest until 2003. That's the problem with this stuff. That's the challenge. People make these changes that God asked them to make, and they go, and? Okay, I've extended my tent. Where are the babies? I've learned to touch type. Where's the bestseller? I've gone on my health program. Why am I not losing weight? And, and here's what we do. And this is, it happens over and over and over again in the church, but also in human nature. We make changes, and then we expect to see instant results to those changes. And sometimes we do. And sometimes, sometimes we're making changes that won't, let me use the language, 
won't manifest immediately or in the way that we expected or in the way that we hoped. But because we're making the change, we're going from small to big, we're taking that small tent and saying, nothing wrong with my tent, I'm just making it bigger. And because we're prepared to make the change, God can then do something amazing. Here's, here's the thought I want to finish with, and we're closing. His promise is the thing that is empowering the change. So we can talk about change in a secular perspective. We could just, we could, you could go out of, there, out of this building and you could sign up to a change management course that has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the Bible. And you'll hear brilliant technicians talk about how to make changes. And I actually think that's very valuable. But the change we're talking about is not just that. The change we're talking about is change that's being called for because of what God wants to do in us. Because of what he sees in us. God saw her as mother, not barren. And so I need to make the change to see myself as God sees me, not as I see me. And that, that could be a big challenge. But also as a fellowship, we see ourselves as God sees us, not even as we see ourselves. In the midst of that change, we're also challenged in the way we speak about ourselves. Yeah. We moved from Gloucester to Scunthorpe, went to a shop to buy some furniture. We needed a new piece of furniture. And the lady said, where are you from? I said, we've just moved up from Gloucester. And she said, why? <laughs> Says it all. Why would you move to Scunthorpe, she said. As she tries to sell me furniture for a house in Scunthorpe. All right. Now listen. Those words, unscripted, said everything. I don't need to hear anything else. I don't need to know anything else. What I've just heard is, I hate this place. Right? And actually, we can find ourselves saying those sorts of things about this place, about our church, about our own lives. And God wants to help us change that confession. Not, not weird into weirdness, but into truth. Into truth. And if our mentality changes and our confession changes, then there is a chance that we'll make the physical, practical changes. The everyday changes. The learning to touch type change. The, the, the changing the building change. The thinking about our program change. The thing, those things all become possible when we see ourselves as he sees us and when we speak out what he has said. They can empower us to then make the changes that God wants to change and will help us with. So this weekend, it's all I want you to think about. Tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about the challenges of that, the difficulties of that. We'll talk about the process of that. And on Sunday night, we'll talk about how we do this together. So that together, we can be a community rising to the call to change. Change is natural. It's normal. But more than all of that, it's necessary for the preferred future that God has for us. Amen? If you can, could you stand with me? I'd love to pray for you. The band are going to come and, and join us, and they're going to finish the evening with a couple of songs, and then you are free to go. I'm sure someone will give us the details, but we're back tomorrow afternoon for a couple of sessions, tomorrow evening for a session, and Sunday night for this session. But before we sing, I want to pray. I want to pray a very simple prayer. It's really simple. And the prayer is this, that we would be open to change. 
even if we don't think we need to change. We will be open to it. Even if at this moment we don't want to change, we will be open to it. My granny used to repeat an old, well-worn statement. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I, if my granny was around today, would say to her, that's not in the Bible. Actually, that's rubbish, granny. We can learn new things. We can engage with new ideas. We can take new journeys. We can go on new pathways. We can discover new things if we want to. And if we will open up our hearts, whether we are the youngest person in this room or the oldest person in this room, age has nothing to do with change. You can be 90 and be open to change. You can be 16 and be stuck in your ways. It's none to do with your age. It's nothing to do with your personality. It is to do with our mentality and our hearts. If you are open to change, and that will mean different things for different individuals in this room. If you're open to change, and that may mean something different for different churches represented in this room. If we are open to change, not change for change's sake, but change for purpose's sake. Change for God's sake. Then I believe we can invite Almighty God into our world to help us make that change, to become the person He sees, not the person we see. So I'm going to pray. And if you want to be open to that, all I want you to do is just either raise your hands or hold your hands out in front of you as an act of saying to the Lord, I want to be open to change. Whatever it means for me, I want to be open to what you want to do in me and through me. And so, Lord, I pray for these wonderful people who have taken time and effort to be in this room tonight. The fact that they are here in this room, Lord, means their hearts are open. And Holy Spirit, I pray that, Lord, as we over this weekend, think about the call to change. That there will be a softness within us. There will be a humility upon us. There will be a receptivity. There will be obedience to the voice of the Spirit. Lord, we don't want to be weird. We don't want to be off the wall and we don't want to be stupid. But we do want to be courageous. We do want to be faith-filled. We do want to be men and women who are prepared to see ourselves as mother when the world sees us as barren. We do want to be people who have songs of joy when what should be coming out of us are songs of sorrow. Lord, we want to be people who are prepared to be big and go big even when our circumstances seem to dictate small. Holy Spirit, will you help us? As individuals and as a Christian community, help us to hear the voice of the Father and to follow you in the journey of change so that we may see your kingdom come and we may see your will done. In Jesus' name, amen.